broken up with like a quite a long term girlfriend at the time and um, I think a lot of that was somehow being channeled into some of the some of the lyrics um, with no shoes especially no country boy um, you're a big girl now I was just being more direct I think um, because it was about the relationship kind of, um, that wasn't there anymore my vague sort of like a you know, dreamy sort of stuff. I was getting replaced by something a bit more direct. With the instrumental Area 51, the basic structure of that song had been put down, but during one of Rob's late night nocturnal sessions, he um, laid down all the organ on that, and so we came down the, the next afternoon, and he said, I've, I've, I've finished the song. Played it back, and it's like, yep, that's done. But yeah, see, so pretty much takes off in the, in the middle of it, and I, don't, I, I, I wish I would have seen that moment uh, because it's great you know when people are doing overdubs and stuff you know it's a, it's a thrill watching what, what, watching all the members of the band uh, you know play and, and, sit and, and seeing Rob play it's pretty powerful I suppose if anybody musically quite a few of the things came from what he did I think you know in terms of little riff things that he'd play I mean he, he's one of those people who could come up with a little bit of magic now and again Rob, Rob had the ability to just to, 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 to put an instant like uh, nitrous oxide turbo boost V12 uh, touch to a song. The song would be good, melodic, uh, well arranged, but sometimes he just wouldn't have any fire and he would be, could just do it in an instant like that. Rob lived on the edge. Rob Collins lived on the edge. Rob Collins, he, he was the most, I mean, I've met a lot of characters, unsavory characters. Nice character in my life, but Rob Collins was probably the most unpredictable guy I've ever met in my life. You never knew what you were getting. Rob would could be very, very placid and very, uh, you know, very quiet, and then he could be terrifying the next moment. You know, he could be completely un unhinged. You know, but then so could a couple of other guys in the band. I don't think he was any crazier than any anybody else, really. You might, you know, a bit, maybe a bit darker. He was a rock and roll rebel, you know. Uh, reckless, yeah. Thoughtful. 50-50. <laughs> I, I was kind of terrified of him at first, when I first started doing the press. And as I got to know him, I just thought, he's just, you know, he's fucking funny. But bear in mind, when I first met him, he'd just come out of prison. And so, you know, again, like I was saying, that you, did, you know, didn't know people of your peer group who died. Didn't know people who'd fucking been in been in prison either and um, thankfully I don't know many more of them since either but uh, he was I mean he was bonkers but he was brilliant you know really heart of gold I remember at one point he had you know he, he did bonkers things like he'd he nicked a, he nicked a, like a concierge bell from a from a hotel and he had this on stage and he, could, he if he needed someone to sort of help out or he needed a drink or anything like that, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> he's looking at this bloke hitting this fucking bell on stage. You could debate with people 
that the Charlatans were the best rock and roll band at that time. What wasn't up for debate was the party lifestyle. They were the Manchester United, they the rock and roll world. There's nobody could touch them. There's crew members lying across Europe and that who thought they could go on a Charlatans tour, but never survived it. A hedonistic lifestyle is that everybody's kind of enjoying is great, but people kind of tend to do it at, tend to do it at their own pace. I mean, you, you don't all go out to, to a club and they all come back in the same taxi. People would be coming and going at different times, and that's when the studio got a reputation for being somewhere where you could, someone could come and have a good time. And that necessarily wasn't a good thing. There'd be people turning up just because it was a good place to hang out. So that would then be like, you know, and then that would break our little kind of, break our little inner circle a little bit. And then that, that would, you know, that's when, that's when things started to go a little bit, a little bit pear-shaped. But, it didn't affect the music too much, you know. The, the, the record, Ten Stories, still got made, and because it, 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 it generally had a, a sound and a life of its own, uh, but the process of making it had, had changed slightly, and the and, and the personnel making it had also changed slightly. I think Rob was going through quite a lot of changes as a human being, you know, and I think um, you know it, it, it was distracted quite easily during the making of Telling Stories. I wouldn't say he wasn't turning up, but he wasn't, he's, I don't think he was totally into it, you know what I mean? I think he got into a few scrapes with a few dodgy people. He was having a difficult time anyway at that time, you know I mean? It, yeah, he'd it, it uh, been at prison, you know, it, uh, his, uh, you know maybe relationships uh, uh, weren't uh, going great. I think with anybody that goes to an institution like prison, I think it will have an effect on your well-being or your, your outlook on things, definitely. It definitely didn't make him any better, you know. And when he came back, he, was, he started, you know, he's just, I guess, more into harder drugs and kind of, you know, um, and seemed to sort of like, you know, be interested in buying rifles and, you know, and, you know, and, taking on other personas and stuff, you know, it's kind of quite weird, but... When he came out, he was a completely different person. He wasn't the same guy that went in. So, I don't know, I've got my, uh, my doubts about uh, the rehabilitation nature of prison. I don't think it does rehabilitate. I think it actually can destroy people. The atmosphere had been a bit fractious, uh, uh, but we decided that we were going to have a night out, and uh, 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 we, we went off into... Uh, 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 to paint the town in Monmouth, uh, well not paint it, just have a couple of drinks and uh, it came to well, closing time and uh, uh, I'm, trying to I'm trying to remember exactly what happened but uh, uh, I was, uh, the, me, Rick and Rob were going to go back in Rob's car and uh, as, as, uh, as we were going out to it, um, uh, Tim's girlfriend at the time, uh, Beth, uh, turned up outside the pub in her car so I went back with her to show her the way back and, um, and, uh, um, and we led the way. I remember seeing headlights in the back that we all thought it was Rob um, and um, all of a sudden those headlights disappearing and you know it's windy roads so didn't really think anything of it you know apart from you know maybe turn around and go to get some cigs or something like that. Uh, gone to the off license, so. and then um, and then he just didn't come back. I don't know, maybe forty-five minutes, an hour uh, since we got back from the pub, and uh, uh, the police uh, uh, were in the kitchen at Mono Valley, saying uh, that uh, we needed to go to uh, Abergavenny Hospital because there'd been an accident. I don't know why, but the whole journey, I just kept like the lyrics to one to another just kept going through my head, and I kind of felt that there's some weird thing and it's like that this is probably the last song we'll ever do you know while they were parking up i said well, i'll go i'll get out and i'll go and find out what's happened and uh, went and uh, found a nurse and they said well i'm really sorry but you but your friends died in total shock for 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 days i suppose I, I could, you know it's, it's hard to take in because uh, uh, she was, you know, she was quite matter of fact, you know. I mean, well, I suppose that there's no point pussyfooting around, is there? You just got to break the news to someone, and it, it was just, um, you know, that, that was the last thing that uh, uh, we expected. Uh, uh, you know, devastating. 
Uh, absolutely devastating, yeah. Just remember being in bed that night on the phone, ringing about three in the morning. And that's when you knew this. Uh, you know, there's something wrong. I picked up the phone and it was our manager, Steve Harrison. He said, you know, Rob's dead. Uh, and about an hour after that, Steve turned around, around to my house and just explained the circumstances. It, yeah, it was a, it was a massive uh, shock, really. Uh, you know, Robert was, he was a bit reckless. He, he flirted with that side of things. Uh, sometimes very, uh, it was very endearing. Other times it was, it was a bit, you know, it was a bit, pushed the boundaries a bit too far. But, um... Yeah, it was a real bolt from the blue, to say the least. I was at home and I just got a, a telephone call off uh, Steve, our manager, and he, you know, you know, you just got that feeling straight away. So it's horrible, it's cliche, but it's true. You just, you know, something terrible's happened, and I kind of knew, really, what had happened because it was kind of, you know, it was, uh, it was always a possibility that, you know, that, you know, he might do something. Uh, Accident, accidental, uh, and yeah. So it was when I just drove back down to the studio that early that morning. I was in tears driving the car down the, down the M5. You know, couldn't believe it. He'd definitely gone through that period of uh, what what you know what what that incident, what that prison sentence had done to him. He'd definitely been through a lot of changes, but he was definitely coming out the other side. He'd accepted who he was and accepted how gifted he was and what a great songwriter he, he was. And he'd started to think about that side of his life again. And then, unfortunately, he never made it. You know, we never, we never saw him completely healed. There was only me and Mark there on, on the night that he died. Um, and then the next day, obviously, you know, Steve Harrison, our manager, uh, Martin and, and, and John all kind of came down at their own pace and kind of like, you know, decided what we were going to do. And, and um, I don't know why, uh, sort of like, you know, before, you know, I mean, it's weird, isn't it? It's like, why would someone say, what, so what are you going to do then? But of course, within, 24 hours, you know, that question was, you know, it was, it was there, it was like, and, um, but, you know, John Brooks straight away said, well, we've got to carry on, you know, and um, fair play to him, you know, I mean, because that was what I think we all wanted to hear, and, um, and, um, No one had any better ideas, you know. We had to make a decision quite quickly. Um, you know, probably, uh, and within maybe a, a week, ten days, uh, we had to decide right what we're doing. Um, and and the and the first commitment that we had was Nebworth. We had to decide whether we could still do it, and you know, I mean, obviously Rob, you know, it's like obviously a massive part of the sound. Um, I wasn't sure, personally, whether we could do it or not, and uh, I don't think any of us were. Um, so I think, I think, I think we, I think we decided that we wouldn't do it, and then, um, pretty much within a couple of hours, Jeff Barrett rang and he said, uh, "I want to put Martin Duffy forward," uh, and I thought, "Oh, that's it. That, that's the perfect. He's the perfect." person to do it. We were in the middle of doing Vanishing Point in our album, so, and sh obviously the Charlatans were in the middle of doing Telling Stories, so they had to make a decision really. Do we just 
just stop and just have a think about things. I don't know. For six, that could be six months, a year, or do we just we just do we just, we just do what we plan to do? We said we'd, we'd have a day or two to see if it would work, uh, and Martin fitted in really well. Had a lot of empathy for the sound we wanted because uh, I say people like Rock Collins they don't grow on trees. He's a brilliant bloke, Martin. He's in, um, you know, he's an incredibly talented player. And so, you know, if there's somebody who could just go, right, I can slot into this. And he, you know, he's a really nice chap to be around, Martin. So he's, I think he would have been, um, you know, he probably would have helped them immensely. Again, it's all, all in that kind of therapeutic process. In a way, continuing with the music and set themselves for that gig, maybe it filled the... You know, it gave them something to occupy themselves. You know, maybe that, maybe that's if they just stopped. It might, maybe, who knows? There's always going to have to be a first gig. They might as well have made it then. Might as well have made it in front of 120,000 people. Why, you know, as opposed to doing their own gig in front of their own audience, which in a way would probably even be more emotional. It was a big statement to make that they were going to do their gigs and carry on as a band. I mean, I mean, let's face it, that would have, to lose your friend, that could have probably killed a lot of bands off, but they decided to go on. As a comeback show, you know, after this sort of, this, this tremendous traumatic thing has happened to you, to come back and to play that show so soon afterwards, staggering. Things like Nebworth with, with the Oasis shows, I mean, it's once in a generation really, things like that come along. Basically Oasis had put on like the gig of the century and sort of like turned it into, you know, some, you know a massive event. We thought, okay, we, you know, we, we can't bring him back. Let's, let's, not, let's not walk around with our heads bowed down and let's, you know, let's, let's honor the man in, 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 the, in the songs we play and let's, you know, let's, Let's kind of in, enjoy it the way he would have enjoyed it. So we kind of thought, let's, oh no, let's get a helicopter. <laughs> you know? So we did something ridiculous. So, so we flew a helicopter into the gig. As soon as it touched the ground, everyone's mood just completely flips into like, sort of, you know, extra, extreme focus. It was a really weird day. I don't think the, the, there was no sort of like, Chit chat going on in the dressing room is all very quiet. It's a different type of adrenaline, you know, it wasn't just your normal pre gig adrenaline, that's for sure. I didn't know whether we were gonna like just completely crumble on stage or show people that we could survive without our star player, and, and that's what we did. And you know, and I think we went on. Um, you know, like, like wolves, you know, and we tore it up. I mean, looking back, it took tremendous fortitude and courage to get up on that stage. And when they played, it really was, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, talk about um, kind of like, um, you know, screaming against the dying of the light. I mean, they, that was a ferocious gig. I mean, they just, you know, they, they, it was superb. I mean, in many ways, to me, it was, as much as it was the Oasis show, it was, it was the Charlatan's Day. I don't know how long we were on for, but yeah, I think they came off the stage a different kind of band, really. It definitely felt like something was over, and it was, you know, something was over. Um, but we did a, a performance that was so real and, and, and so compelling, really, that um, it allowed us to continue for, for another however long it's been since then. <laughs> adrenaline rush I've ever experienced really. 
And then I spent 10 years mourning after that. When you lose a close friend, you kind of, you have regrets and then you, you know, you think, what if? And then you think, what now? But it pushes you as well, you know. What would have Rob done, you know? What would have, you know? So it can push you, you know, someone's death can push you further, you know. So um, death is inspiration at times. All the people gathered round and see the sunset high. Leaders and young disused milk will quietly pass you by. What will it we could have uh, dealt we dealt with the loss of Rob actually was just to make sure the album gets finished and put ourselves back into the process of doing something and working there wasn't any more songs to write but there was a few that were kind of like um, you know not quite there yet Ten Stories had, had kind of had, uh, had been conceived it was it was in the end of its gestation period, it, we knew what it was going to sound like. We had, we had the, we had the kind of, we had all the ammunition to put it together. Where there's a few bits and pieces missing, a few songs that needed to be completed. There's a few keyboard parts that hadn't materialised, and then, you know, and then we enlisted the help of Martin, Martin Duffy, and, and, he, and he came in, and you know, he, he really, he really took Rob's kind of spirit on board. Not only did he do it brilliantly, he kind of somehow put his own twist on it as well, and and kind of, you know, made it, you know, different enough to be appreciated in a, in a totally new way as well, which kind of, so it kind of saved our skin, but also kind of added a new element to it as well. He played like what like Rob would have wanted someone to play like, but but in his own style. And, and, and you know, if you listen to the record, you, you know, you, you, you definitely can't, it's a seamless join where Martin Duffy plays and Rob stops playing. There's no, there's no, there's no, Divide where it's and that's just that's that's two great musicians collaborating, you know, one from one side of of life and one from the other side of life, and the two were, were brought together, great there. So it's that's just, it's a beautiful thing, really. We found something that Rob had been working on, which is quite um, quite a good find, really. But it was it, it was um, someone had recorded him when he was like three years old. And, and he brought it in, and it, it made this bit of music uh, with the second engineer, and put put it together about him talking, kind of like saying all this, you know, uh, really sweet stuff. put it at the end of the album because you know I mean we didn't know whether he was intending to put it on the album or not um, or whether he was just making it <laughs> don't know not not knowing what was you know what his future was gonna be it was weird when you know when you get, get into mixing and you're mixing in Rob's vocals you know you got you, there's Rob on a fader uh, and uh, you know he's not he's not with with you anymore but he is uh, and uh, uh, we were hearing him every day. It was weird, but it was actually, uh, you know, quite. Um, uh, um, I don't know what the word is. It was. Um, uh, com it was. It was. It was. It was comforting for us to. to, uh, to we've lost our mate, but, we, it, but he's, he's always going to be with us, uh, 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 and he always is. Uh, and uh, we even, uh, even now, you know, I mean, because uh, we, we run samples live. Uh, and the certain songs, and Rob's still uh, still with us uh, uh, to this day. You know, he, he still comes on tour with us. Uh, uh, can't get rid of him. The idea was was just to make it look normal, but shoot it slightly out of pro, so it looked okay, but a little bit odd without being really weird, man. Obviously, shooting a band like the Charlatans or any band, in fact, it's it's quite difficult to get all the buggers 
paying attention at the same time. So um, I was on the train on the way down uh, to shoot them individually so, so I can just strip them in separately. But basically that, that, that was it, it was just like a, a, a keep it as simple as possible, you know, it's not a remorseful sleeve. People have said, I was asked it, by uh, Marianne Hobbs or something, it was the white background uh, representing the amount of cocaine they were taking at the time. Uh, could be, wouldn't know myself, you know. But um, but no, that was it. And I think we kind of got away, got away with it. It's sort of a statement of intent, very solid. And they had to appear to be um, solid after sadly losing Rob. We had the sort of playback party in here. We seemed to play it back about a hundred times doing copies and things. I thought it was a really good record and, um, and I think they did but um, as to the inner feelings I don't know really. We made a great record and that record had to come out you know people had to hear it and we had to play it. Everything fell into place. All the singles sounded great, the production sounded great, the dynamics of the record sounded great. Releasing that album pushed them in so many different new directions and it was completely pivotal and it was the, the best album to date as well at that point and every single song on that record is great. Or just seem to have a life of their own. They kind of just grow, grow themselves, and you know you're onto something good. You, you, you know when it's happening. You know, God, this is there's something special about this. So, and you could tell with those songs there was something. Yeah, they had a life of their own. You know. Euphorically, I think telling stories hit a, a, a real high note. The album is an up album. It really is because it was kind of like coming off the. Euph of having a, you know, the, the, uh, Charleston's being number one, um, doing these great singles, and it's just kept going up and up and up. It's not the work of people that have just suffered a bereavement. This, is, this was an album that was pretty much done, pretty much written, pretty much complete when the tragedy happened. So it, 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 it's, it, and it, it's Rob's, and it's Rob's, you know, it's Rob's last album. So, so Rob's very much present on that record. The live shows were were, 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 were starting to come out of arenas then as well, and uh, uh, it was. Um, I think I think uh, uh, Rob would have would have enjoyed it. The one kind of sad thing about it is, is that the, all the publicity that Rob generated for the band by his, by 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 the, some of the things that he did, and then ultimately in his death, did push the record to 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 that stratospheric level. You know, it became his. You know, it became his his, his last will and testament musically. When that went to number one, we felt as though we had to uh, celebrate, and uh, you know, so we we were champagne it up. We we were we were hiring private planes and helicopters because we felt as though we we had to really celebrate uh, being number one. And why not? Sort it. It was a very special time, and um, and eventually the album came out, and then so it was quite sad when I we carried on with Scream. It was kind of it was a kind of it was a sad time, but they came out of it strong, stronger. It's this stuff of legend, isn't it? You know, someone from a very popular band goes into another popular band and then comes back out again, and it you know he's done what he had to do, and he's leaving this town, and it's, you know the, the old cat comes off to duff for doing that. It's fantastic. Save the van, probably. We knew that it was only a temporary thing, but it allowed us, I don't know, four or five months to sort of like contemplate who was going to be Rob's uh, replacement or the new member of the Charlatans. Um, and um, Martin had heard that um, there's a, a really great Hammond organ player, and that was kind of like the 
not not a keyboard player, but a Hammond organ player who lived, um, you know, within just a mile or so of, of where Rob Collins was living before he died. And it just seemed like to, uh, you know, you couldn't invent that story. I had a phone call from a, a, a friend of mine and he said, there's a guy you should check out from a band called Joe. And he said, it's uncanny. He's, he's very much in the vein of, of, of Rob Collins. The playing and the sound and even the slight look about him. And I said, what do you mean by the slight look about him? He said, well, he looks a bit like the actor, Richard Beckinsdale. We did a, kind of like an audition, I suppose it was, in Stone. And I went up there and they gave me a few numbers to play. And then we, so I went up there, played the numbers, and then if I remember right, and I might be wrong, I can't remember the, I can't remember the songs. Uh, weirdo, one to another, North Country Boy, and another one, can't remember. As soon as he started playing, he just had that sound again. It was, it was reborn. It was just a kind of like, you know, it was just a, the, the book had been reopened and we'd started again. It was, it was wonderful. If you could make someone to replace Rob, it would be sound. Perfect musician in every way for, to carry on what Rob did and, and, and add his own thing as well. Lovely guy, dear friend. Uh, so just things, things have a habit of, of, of just kind of turning around and, and working out for the best. We went there to finish off the album and, it, you know, it became the last time we went to Tomorrow Valley to record. And um, it was just too heavy, you know, it was too, too, you know, you know, it was just too much, really. And, um, and I think, you know, it wouldn't have been a good place to have a fresh start. We knew as well, um, Telling Stories was, was going to be our last uh, record for Beggar's Banquet. It's on into a new record label, and Tony being on board, it did feel like, yep, it's, it's new beginnings. I wouldn't say it was, it was a, an end of an era, but it was a closing of, of, of one chapter. Any passes, Without sounding like a, an absolute fool, I mean, I, I felt that if I wanted to um, kind of do with the charlatans what my hero Bob Dylan at the time was doing, it was like bringing it all back home, I was 61 Bond on Bond, so up to, up to our hips. The charlatans album and then the Tony Stories, it was our version of that. Tony Stories was our Blonde on Blonde and wasn't as only would be our John Wesley Harden where we kind of like go back, new place, new start, but actually get off the merry-go-round you know, of, of, of um, yeah, getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. The Charlies have always come back fighting, which is, you know, you know, for all, all kinds of problems, you know. And certainly around this album, you know, you can't get a bigger problem, you know, but they've overcome it, you know, it's great. Good on them. Charlotte's don't give up, never give up. The show goes on, you know, so, you know, other bands would have been, yeah, knocked out in the first round. But I don't know how many rounds they've done now. It seems like they've gone, they've done, you know, seven or eight rounds already, but they've obviously they've got, a, they've got a few more rounds in them, that's for sure, you know, but um, yeah, you keep fighting. There is a dream that, that can be that can be chased and, and it can be caught and you can make it happen, it, it can be reality. We did it and countless bands have done it before us and countless bands will do it after us. You know, with our band anything is possible. Every, everything that can happen to a, a musical story of a group happens to us. And I still think there's quite a few chapters to go, you know. Mm -hmm.